Hello, good evening. It's 10 p.m. and live from the news hub at Adisawi Kandai in Accra. This is our last bulletin for the day. You can also hear us live on 3FM 92.7 and follow our live stream on Facebook and on 3news.com. Let's start with the day's major news highlights. The Kufuado has charged African leaders to prioritize the creation of a peaceful atmosphere to ensure the African youth becomes part of processes of creating a peaceful world. The president was speaking at the launch of the Global Peace Intergenerational Dialogue in Accra. On tonight, the Attorney General has filed transcripts of leaked recordings of NDC chairman's comments that has resulted in his prosecution along with forensic analysis of the audio tape. An Accra High Court hearing the case was forced to adjourn sitting because the AG filed the statements together with four other documents Monday morning. And eight persons believed to be the leaders of a group called Homeland Study Group Foundation have been arrested. The group aimed at seceding from Ghana to declare an independent country called Western Togoland. The arrest was made Sunday, May 5th, in the course of a meeting to finalize arrangements to declare independent Western Togoland on May 9th. On tonight, the Office of the Chief Justice has created a special court for the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, to begin prosecuting employers who default in the payment of Tier 2 pensions contributions. The NPRA urged employees to report defaulting employers so the authority can clean up the system and ensure that aid, uh, the right protection mechanisms exist for workers. Those are our major news highlights. Remember, you can follow our live stream on Facebook. You can hear us also on 3FM 92.7. And uh, also follow our live stream on 3news.com. Up next is the big one. Welcome back. Now, with Ghana falling from uh, first to third as best-ranked country, Africa, in the World Press Freedom Index, many have projected a bleak future for journalism if nothing concrete is done about the incessant attacks on journalism. In the following News Desk report, we'll take a look at major incidents and its impact contributing to the current state of press freedom in our country. Ghana lost its bragging rights as Africa's best-ranked country in the World Press Freedom Index, having dropped four places from 23 to 27 in the 2019 edition. Ghana's worst performance was in 2013, when it ranked 30, and its best was 2015, ranking 22. In 2014, Ghana had 27 and made it to 26th spot in 2016 and 2017. In a report in 2016, the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice said the then President John Mahama breached the country's gift policy in accepting the controversial Ford gift by a Bukinabe contractor, Jibru Kanazoya, after investigative journalist Manasa Azur witnessed investigations into the matter. The Commission, however, concluded the former president's action did not bridge the bribery, corruption or conflict of interest laws of the country. This was not cited as a matter that put the journalist's life under threat. In 2018, a report by Media Foundation for West Africa indicated 17 journalists were attacked within 15 months in Ghana. The index compiled by Reporters Without Borders cited the murder of Tiger IPI investigative journalist Ahmed Hussein Swali and police harassment of journalists as factors for the poor ranking. 
this year after producing an investigative piece on some security operations at the Osu Castle, Joy FM's investigative journalist Manasa Azura Awane had to go into hiding after he became target of death threats. Last week, Star FM's Upper East correspondent Edwin Adetis residence was broken into three days after his investigation led to the resignation of a Minister of State, Roxana Bukhari. With these records just five months into 2019, many fear Ghana will drop further in the World Press Freedom Index. All right, let's get on to the telephone lines. Uh, we have the director of the Center for Re European Studies at the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo, uh, joining us. Uh, he has made some interesting observations about all these happenings. Uh, good evening, Prof, and thank you extremely. Uh, one question you have been asking is uh, why should a journalist flee Ghana to seek refuge in a place like South Africa? Do you see a gloomy atmosphere for journalism in this country? Hello, Prof. Hello. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, great. So I'm asking uh, whether you see a gloomy atmosphere for journalists in this country under uh, the circumstance we are hearing of a journalist having to flee to South Africa, for example, to seek refuge. Well, well, I, I think. Um, let's not see it is gloomy yet. I mean, this is something that has happened and we got wind of it um, over the weekend and we try to speak our mind, you know, about it um, in a manner to, that seeks to draw the attention of policymakers, you know, to some of these things that have the tendency or potency to silence the voices of reason and conscience mm. and to play, um, to relax our our democratic advancement. It must be noted that in fledgling democracies, it is quite normal for those who seek to expose the rots in the system and those who subject regimes to strict rules by keeping them on their toes to be threatened by apparatchikis and elements within the regime without sanction and support from official dom necessarily. Um, this is quite normal, and those of us who seek to keep regimes on their toes aren't oblivious of it. However, it becomes a bit worrying when, you know, for a nation's quest, it becomes a bit worrying for a nation's quest for democratic sustenance when a journalist has to flee for refuge in another country for his safety. This, in my view, is certainly um, not good, and it's not an indication for our quest to climb higher the ladder of democratic progression. Mm. Journalists fleeing to, for safety is completely alien to our fourth republic. We know that journalists go through so many things. Some go through verbal threats. Um, others receive um, text messages to threaten them. Some are physically abused. And some, in some years back, had their offices desecrated with human ex excreta. But these have not led to anyone's flight from the country, you know, for refuge. So what Manasi is going through now is, in my view, completely alien to Ghana's Fourth Republic. And it's important that we draw attention of policymakers to it. Uh, like I said, um, the threatening and what compelled him to move out of the country may not be sanctioned by official Adam. They may not be sanctioned you know, by the head of state and mm. all that. So it's important that they come out to make an emphatic statement about it to prevent the idea that people who hold dissenting views will have to fly or flee from the country um, just to protect themselves and just to seek their own safety. It is not good for our democracy. Mm. Now, Prof, you, you have stated uh, that occasionally you receive threats, which you, like you said, you know that the president of the republic uh, wouldn't necessarily sanction that. This is affecting his administration uh, some way. Uh, what concrete steps would you suggest that the presidency takes in order to... Uh, uh, in order to clean up the image of his administration. No, you, should, and, you should know uh, that in the developing countries um, um, like ours, um, power is everything. So people say, seek ye if, seek if first um, the political kingdom and everything will be added onto you. Once you get power, you get everything. And so people will do all they can to protect um, power. 
particularly um, given the high rate of unemployment and poverty that um, um, life outside political power, you know, um, grants to, um, you know, people. And so they will do all they can. But it's up to those um, who are re re really controlling power to appreciate some of these things. And when we hear that people in their bid to protect power are doing things that run afoul of democratic ideas and tenets, we have to come out openly and clearly to debunk or to, to condemn those acts and to speak, you know, with a loud voice that, and uh, uh, with an emphatic voice, making the case that uh, we cannot relapse our democratic gain simply because we want to uh, maintain power and all that. So what I'm saying is that we want to hear the president loud and clear, making an emphatic statement, you know, condemning what um, Manasseh has gone through, and then also pledging his commitment that um, it is not under his regime that we would relapse into the dark days of culture of silence. I, I, in my view, I think an emphatic statement will, be, will do for starters, and then they can go uh, behind the scenes to look at those who um, did what he did to compel the young man to um, flee the country. I know that uh, whilst we we focus uh, mostly, the focus has been on uh, state actors and state institutions and their actions against journalists and all, but there appear to be a subtle uh, move of intimidation, bullying, and all you could call it on 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 social media, which usually comes from uh, party elements or, or opposition elements targeted at everyone. Do you get the sense that as a country, perhaps we're becoming uh, intolerant of each other's views and opinions and we've expressed this in how hostile and, and abusive we get on social media also? Well, like I said, um, people are always interested. We haven't got into that stage in our political uh, dispensation where people, especially majority of you know, full singers and apparatchikis who look at things from this passionate you know, point of view. They always want to um, support um, their party stance and so we, uh, we tend to have an overly partisan uh, population uh, that would want to do all they want they can to support regime, uh, regime's hold on power. In so doing, uh, whatever you do, that, that uh, is interpreted to mean against a regime. If you offer a voice of dissent, those who support the regime would dissent on you. And this one is quite normal. And um, like I said, some of us have been doing this over the years. And we, we know of the insults and the threats and attacks, you know, verbal attacks that come to us. But it is quite normal for a fledgling democracy to go, you know, through um, these things. But I know that as we climb higher the ladder of democratic progression, um, we would, these things would sometimes would become right. a thing of the past. But we must not um, relapse. We, uh, if, if the threats are now beginning to assume the form or the nature that uh, forces people to flee out of the country, then it is not an indication that we are doing well as a nation right. in climbing higher the ladder of democratic progression. And something must be done immediately about that. Something about. must be done. Uh, Prof, we're grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Professor uh, Jumpo is the head of European Studies at uh, the University of Ghana, Lagos. I'm Stephen N.T. This is News at 10. You can hear us live on 3FM 92.7 and follow our live stream on Facebook and on 3news.com. We have more news for you. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, some university students have called for improved security on all university campuses to protect life and property. This follows a robbery attack on one of their colleagues along the Pentagon, uh, James Topnell Singh, uh, Yanka Hall Road. My colleague, Ajua Adubia, also uh, was on the premises of the University of Ghana. This is where some unidentified men attacked a final year students of the University of Ghana and inflicted machete wounds on his head, leg, and hands. The streets are still not lit, even after the university instituted some measures ensuring that the streets is lit to ensure that the students here are safe. I currently have some students here who are going to tell me whether the measures that the university have instituted has actually restored some sense of security among them. What can yes, you tell us about the security situation here on campus? 
Yeah, the security situation here on campus um, is actually nothing to write home about. Just at the beginning of the semester, someone was murdered uh, closer to the school gates. They were like, oh, they are going to improve on, uh, upon the security measures and all. For our various halls, the security measures are good. They check those going in and coming out. But then our streets where we, we bypass during late hours, like exam week like this, some of the students need to get to the BAM library to go and study. And when they are coming back to their various hostels, uh, as late hours, we don't have street lights around, and then some of the security men too are the very far ends of the streets. Right, uh, let's uh, speak with Emmanuel Koting, the executive director of the Africa Center for Security and Counterterrorism is on the phone line. So good evening, sir. Thank you very much and uh, for your time. If we take a look at the university settings, it's very difficult to identify an intruder, really. How can the university uh, and other institutions uh, put in place proper security measures to protect their students? Well, thank you for having me and good evening to your cherished viewers. In fact, um, if you look at the University of Ghana um, campus, I think the university authorities have not been proactive. If you look at the incident we are witnessing, it's not new. You know that when it gets to exam period, you have students who are the students hedging with regular students. And as a result of that, you see a lot of irregular activities on campus. So what the authorities need to be doing is to put that strategy. And the security personnel should not be interested in only the vehicles that mm. are entering and going out, but the people who are going in and out as well. So you realize that these criminals, they could be carrying implements you don't know in their backpacks like their students and things like that. So if you go to many of the universities abroad now, access to university campus is limited. You should have an ID card and they should be willing to produce that ID card on demand. I think the students on the other hand will equally have to bear with management, especially the security, if such uh, uh, identification is sought. I think the other thing the university ought to do is the kind of training they give, with, uh, they give to their private security personnel. Mm -hmm. If you look at the campus, and in particular the place this incident took place, I think it was something that was avoidable. Because if you zone the university into four zones, it will be easy to patrol and given that it's exam period, like I mentioned, places that don't have um, uh, these street lights, they patrol. But, but Mr. Cotton, Mr. Cotton, in our interaction with the students, the impression we get is that the whole university community had only one patrol vehicle which patrols the entire school. So whether we zone it into four or zone it into one, it does remain that the logistics necessary to give uh, total protection to every student is lagging behind. One patrol vehicle is roughly inadequate, even the fees these universities are charging. And you recall that there was some misunderstanding between national security and the university on one hand over the security arrangements and the sighting of uh, uh, the two boots and stuff like that. I think what the university needs to do is just to eat their ambu pie and collaborate with national security. Like you mentioned, if there's only one patrol vehicle for a large campus like the University of Ghana, it means that we are not giving priority to our students. Mm. And the safety of our students should be paramount to any other. But, 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 but what can the students themselves do to protect themselves? Because obviously the responsibility of protecting uh, anyone depend, first depends on themselves. That is why I was talking about the introduction of the agitators, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, security will have the authority to inspect those agitators on demand and it's incumbent on students to cooperate. 
And those that are living on campus, when it comes to exam period that they have their friends living with them, they should be able to be each other's keepers and make sure that people who are not known to them, especially if, they, if you go to the halls, the halls, uh, 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 how do they call them, the, the authors, or is it the authors, the hall tutors? I think at the hall they have internal security before you enter. You have to pick your keys and things from them. What they do is that they only check after 10 o'clock. 10 p.m., students who are entering and exiting the hostels. I think it should be a 24-hour duty, mm. such that they can be sure about people who are entering and exiting at the right people right. entering and meeting the right, uh, the right people, because you cannot prevent family and friends from visiting one of their homes in this hostel. But it must make sure they are properly checked. But are you confident that the university, the steps taking, uh, the, the steps promised by the university authorities will be enough? They promise, for example, to improve lighting in those places which lack them and weed around those perimeters where there are corners and bushes for intruders to, 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 to hide and all. Will these be enough? I think the issues go beyond that, and that will never solve the situation at hand. I think, like I mentioned, they need to go back to the basics, give proper training to their security guards, collaborate with national security, make sure that they have more interest on persons entering and exiting and not the vehicles, because it becomes easier for these criminals to dress like students and put implements they can use for this kind of attacks on their backs as if they are students. And it is also incumbent on students to be security averse and make sure that if they see anything on tower, they report to the right. appropriate agencies on campus. Mr. Koti, we're grateful for your time. Thank you extremely. Imano Koting is a security analyst and uh, thanks to you all for making time to be with us on behalf of the crew. Good night. I'm Stephen Enti. I'm black and I'm proud. There's more news at 3news.com. Please stay tuned.